Hello, my dear Franken friends, and welcome to Spook You, your one stop shop for all things ghastly and ghoulish. I'm your host, Barnabas Vixen, and we've got a very special episode for you today. I'd like to introduce you all to Scares Media of Creepy Text, a new narrator here in the horror narration community. He's going to be joining our vivacious voiceover virtuoso in today's series of scary stories. And be sure to head on over to his channel and annihilate that subscribe button and check out his content. He's got a few videos up right now with even more to come. Let him know that Barnabas sent you. Now without further ado, let's delve into tonight's stories. Maestro, dim the lights and put on that music I like. Now shush, it's starting. This is not my story. It happened to my dad's best friend, R, in his youth. R had a school holiday job working as a co-conductor on a freight train. And this entailed sitting up front with the train driver through the night and basically just keeping him awake. One morning, though, in the early hours, R and the train driver were sitting, talking as usual, as their train traveled through a heavy thunderstorm through a rural part of my country. They saw a pale man standing on the tracks ahead of them, with long, dark hair that was plastered against his body in the downpour. Their train was headed straight for him and they could do nothing to avoid him. Now, R says he had occasionally been on trains that had hit stray farm animals and such like and he knew the feeling of a thud from the impact that it would cause. The train sped towards this man and R braced himself but they felt no impact even though they knew they had hit the man. Along the train tracks, there are concrete pillars with numbers on them to help the drivers identify their location as they travel. The train driver made a highly unorthodox, unplanned stop as soon as they passed the next station and told R to run in and report the man they had hit to the person in the office. R ran in and told the lady sitting there what had happened and the number of the number on the nearest pillar to the accident had taken place. With a very concerned look in her eyes, she simply told him, you're the third man tonight to make an emergency stop and report the same incident. This is to date the scariest ghost story I've heard. I also want to make a note that R is a high court judge in my country and most definitely not someone to make up a story like this. And thinking about it, well, it gives me chills to this day. My childhood experience and an update from years later. Growing up, I absolutely hated being home. At night, it always sounded like someone was walking around and there were whispers from my closet whenever it was left open. I always made sure it was closed but most mornings it would be partially open. I would refuse to go into the basement even during the day and you could never escape the feeling of someone or something watching you. I am talking full on blankets over the head, no smoking out type of childhood. One night in the summer we had a powerful thunderstorm roll through. I remember it vividly because the lightning was near constant and instead of white and blue the colors were purple and green. The storm took out the power. My father asked me to go to the kitchen and help get the candles and flashlights. I was walking down the dark hallway when some, something jumped out from the bathroom. The kitchen door was 5 feet behind it. Thinking it was my dad trying to scare me, I laughed and I said, nice try. There was a loud growl and my father put his hand on my shoulder from behind me. He pulled me back into the living room, closed and locked the door while saying that it wasn't him and he saw it too. The growling continued from the kitchen entryway for a good 10 minutes and it sounded like something was pacing down the hallway. Dad and I spent the night in the living room. We didn't sleep, we just watched the door. I'm, we moved a few months later. The house we moved to felt good. I had no issues for, with feeling watched or something hearing me or hearing things. Felt like I could sleep without the blankets cover, covered over my head. Years later. When my father was diagnosed with cancer, we started watching the ghost shows on cable that got us talking about that night and what we saw. It was then my father revealed that the house I grew up in was an old renovated funeral home. The way the house was renovated, my closet was the mechanical room for the lift to bring the bodies from the basement embalming room to the viewing room in the first level. Our floor was the funeral director's private living space. My father's aunt actually owned the house and lived on the first floor, which was the floor where they would have weavings as such. 
the house the house has changed hands to cousins of mine talking with them they said they had similar experiences scratching on the walls footsteps banging on the basement bulkhead and lights that would come on dimly as if they were connected in series rather that each light being its own circuit Break time, my darling deviants. I hope you've been enjoying this collaboration. I just wanted to take a second to further remind you to head on over to Scares Media of Creepy Texts and decimate that subscribe button. With today's practice of social distancing and crippling isolation, why not spend that time binging some gruesome stories and discovering new narrators? I know, I know, I'm great, but I'm only here twice a week, so what do you do with the other five days? Work? Who needs work? Spend time with family? But we're family! The horror community! So spend some time with us and by all means, bring those other <clears throat> creatures you call family too. We're not picky. So head on over to Scares Media of Creepy Text and shower him with your love and support. Now that you've proven your obedience and declaration of love, let's get back to tonight's stories. Hey, my name's Oscar. First off, English is not my main language, so I apologize in advance for any mistakes. When I was a little kid, my mom left me at a military boarding school in the north of Mexico, right in the Golden Triangle, which in case you don't know, is where most of the drug cartels and mobsters come from. Or at least used to. I was in that place for around 6 years. The activities were the usual military crap, excessive exercise, abuse towards the weak, sexism, and of course camping. We used to go camping a lot and sometimes for weeks at a time. This one time the commanding officers took us to a place that we have never visited before which was in the middle of a huge desert. We set up our camp at the top of a small hill so we could have the high ground. We started gathering all the stuff we needed such as dry wood, leaves and some rocks etc. Soon enough it was pitch black and we could only hear coyotes. We were all trained so we weren't scared of any animals. We held shifts to guard our place. My shift was up from 3 am to 6 am and one of my subordinates was with me. At first everything was fine, we did the usual routes without spotting anything, just chatting every once in a while. At a given time I heard someone yell my name and told to me to come quick, so I did. He was standing on the edge of the hill. He pointed in the dark and said, look. Between the sea of darkness that is the northern Mexican desert at night, we could see two lights, like flashlights, as if two people were walking one behind the other. At first it was just a small spot, but then they kept getting closer. I took the decision to let the officer on duty know, so we woke him up. Officer S was a grumpy bipedal bull who had been in the army for around 40 years and had been boxing champion some years back. So he truly was a force to be reckoned with. So he stood next to us and looked at the lights. Just a second later, he was yelling, informing us trainees from the boarding school and the army. There was no response, no pause. The lights kept creeping closer. Officer S woke up all of the big guys and called the headquarters. He left me in charge of the rest of the sleeping guys while he went to investigate with a gun in his hand and with a full platoon of gorillas. I could see them all navigate in the darkness. Officer S was the head while the rest were followed in formation. The lights were still moving. They stopped by his orders and he kept walking. Just when he was a few meters away from whatever it was, the lights went off and there was nothing else anymore. I saw how Officer S took out a pocket flashlight only to find nothing. He immediately turned and came back to the camp. He was a little pale and just told us that whatever it was, it was no human. He stood guard with us until everyone woke up and we left first thing in the morning. We didn't even had our breakfast and never even knew what it was. Thankfully, I guess. Really quick, before we get this story started, the author did want me to mention that this story comes from the Philippines, which is actually where they're from. I will do my best to make this short. This incident happened when I was, I think, 20 or 22 years old. During one summer vacation, I went back home from university. I used to be an active church member of a Christian church, but when I started studying far away from home, I kind of stopped. My grandma, on the other hand, is still a very, very active churchgoer, and annoyingly, she signed me up to join a youth camp. 
It was not for free and she paid for it for me. And I didn't want to disappoint her, so I ended up going. The campsite was actually really close to my house. It was held at a very old college, <laughs> almost ancient, because that was where grandma and her siblings also went. And it was so old and was said to be haunted. Now the thing is, I'm very picky when it comes to restrooms. Obviously, the college restrooms did not have any shower and it looked unsanitary. I can't imagine using it at all. I was going to sleep on the fourth floor, which is a classroom, and I was going to sleep there with nine other women. Before sunset, I approached my cousin, who was a member of the worship team, and I told him I just couldn't shower there, so if he could accompany me at around 4 a.m. to go back home and take a shower before the activity starts at 6, that would be great. He agreed, so I prepared to see him again early in the morning. I went to the classroom, and on my way there at the staircase, I saw Ara's sister. Now, Ara is one of the girls there around my age, and her sister is MJ. She was wearing a white bathrobe and looked like she was about to go to the restroom. I called her, but she ignored me as if she didn't hear me, so I let it go. That night, I was already in bed but couldn't sleep and saw MJ again entered the room as if fresh from the shower. I didn't talk to her because I didn't want to make some noise. Moving forward, it is 3 a.m. and I still couldn't sleep. Everybody was asleep already, and the annoying part was it was raining heavily. I texted my cousin that perhaps our plan to go home would not push through anymore because of the heavy rain. He didn't respond, and I began to be worried. Suddenly, I heard strange noises in the window. It was a jealousy one, and outside I can hear dogs. So I thought, dogs in the fourth floor. When I looked at the window again, I saw my cousin outside. And I slowly and softly leaned against the window and told him to just go back to their room because it's not possible to go home and we'll just quickly go out after breakfast instead. I said a lot of things already when I noticed that he wasn't looking straight at me. It was as if he was staring above my head. He didn't say a single thing and he didn't even blink once. He was wearing a white camisa chino. I adjusted the jalousy to look at his feet and it slowly turned into smoke. And also six dogs were surrounding him. In my disbelief, he turned into smoke. I fell on the floor and froze, and I urged myself to snap and went back to bed. I didn't sleep at all. I was under the blanket the whole time, and I didn't care if I couldn't breathe anymore. I was so shocked and scared that I was not able to scream or cry. When the morning came, I saw my cousin. This time, he is real and in flesh. I didn't tell him what I saw yet, but he said the whole worship team didn't sleep at the school because they had to go back to our church and sleep there for lack of electricity. And they also had to practice. He couldn't reply to me because his phone was dead, and since it was raining, he figured I wouldn't want to go. I managed to eat breakfast and met Ara, and I jokingly told her that MJ, her sister, was such a snob. I told her I saw her, but she ignored me. She was confused for a moment, and then said that her sister didn't join the camp. She was still out of town and couldn't go home on time. And that response convinced me that I'm being played by some evil or malignant spirits. I went home as fast as I can and told my grandma everything. It was a four day camp, but I decided to end it immediately. And my grandma asked me, have you prayed that night? And I didn't answer because I haven't. It seems that's all the time we have for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed, and for one last time, make sure you head on over to Scares Media of Creepy Tech's channel and check him out. Subscribe while you're there, and above all else, enjoy these wonderful videos. Now thank you for watching, and make sure you obliterate that subscribe button and ring that little bell. That way you're notified the moment we upload a new video. Oh, and uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter or Instagram, actually both, at Spook You Videos. That's at Spook You Videos on Twitter and Instagram. Now be gone. I've got some spring cleaning to do here at the office and I'm quarantined here until further notice, so I might as well make the most of my time. I mean, there's only so many times I can play Scrabble with the Werecats before they've gone and eaten all the pieces. And the board. And the box too, actually. You know what? I need to order a new game of Scrabble. Until next time, my ghastly gang, stay spooky.